right. So just a point of clarification. Um, I submitted actually three talks to DevOps Days, KC, and that's two titles. The Learning from the Trenches would have been a, a different talk, slightly different flavor, but at any rate. Um, yeah. So when is your company no longer a startup? Uh, maybe you can't feed it on two people, or can't feed it on two pizzas, right? Um, maybe all the original founders are already left. Uh, you may not know when it happens. It may have already happened. You may be operating at scale, uh, but you're not behaving that way as a company. So modern DevOps, I think, uh, the way I think about it, and I think a lot of the talks here and literature say, you know, the 12-factor app, immutable infrastructure, um, disposal environments, that sort of thing. Uh, but a lot of companies, whether they're legacy, large corporations, or they're startup, and they had something to get off the ground, a 1.0, that get it working, it just works, they're not operating that way. They're not doing any of that. And so what do you do? <clears throat> what do you do when DevOps is missing? Uh, you know, how do you migrate legacy systems, mig uh, legacy platforms, update production systems in place, and more importantly, how do you get teams to change behavior? Uh, I think DevOps is a culture, right? Which I think a lot of the, the talks today have talked, have today and yesterday have, have covered that. It's, it's a matter of behavior, and behavior is hard to change. So how do you outgrow a startup culture? My name is Caleb Hyde. Uh, I was gonna be presenting with my colleague, Scott Howell. He actually couldn't make it here today, unfortunately. Um, and Scott and I work together at Pinsight Media, which is downtown KC. Uh, I'm no longer there, but he's still there. And uh, so some of the later content is information that, you know, that he's contributed. Um, so yeah, I wanna give a timeline. A, uh, a tale told in quarters, uh, driven by profits, signifying progress. <laughs> um, so when I joined, uh, second quarter, the end of second quarter, June of, of 2015, last year, there was one man at the time, a small man, not a big man by any means, but John Todd, JT, uh, was kind of keeping the lights on. He was the entire AWS team, infrastructure team. So we call him John Todd Van Dam. Which, I mean, if you ever met him, he's this really sweet man, good guy. And doing everything he could to keep things running. Pinsight at the time and, and now has, uh, depending on how you cut it, eight or so major product platforms, supporting platforms, you know, internal systems like Jenkins for builds and that sort of thing, um, contributing to that. So, you know, eight, eight or 12 platforms, uh, supporting systems, subcomponents of those platforms, um, five developer teams, we had Java enterprise developers, we had mobile developers for Apple, iOS, and, and Android. A lot of different stuff, a lot of interesting things going on. Um, and already at that point, a footprint in AWS of about 300 servers or so. Uh, and each platform, each team was kind of its own thing, right? And that's where I came in. This man, we have five developer teams and one man helping them out, supporting the AWS platform, and, and I come on to help them out. So, uh, what do you do in a case like this? You come into an existing company, Maybe they call themselves a startup, but they've already got, you know, multiple revenue streams, multiple products, and uh, and ostensibly you're you're the you're the AWS steward. You want to help them build some automation, handle deployments. What do you do? Well, it's a lot of little things, and it's actually turned out really well. This this uh, this whole conference. I mean, Polly's opening talk, you know, I think talked about a lot of what I, 
what I was thinking about covering. A lot of this has kind of been covered in the open spaces yesterday and that sort of thing, but you know, talk about it from the management and the leadership perspective. My talk, my perspective is more from the individual contributor. You come in, uh, you don't necessarily have you know, the, the leeway to make purchasing decisions and that sort of thing. What do you do? Um, so JT and I, uh, we, you know, we had a, a ticket queue, a backlog of requests. We had developers that would walk into our cubes asking for deploys. Um, sometimes three different people stand in your cube. Uh, we had Slack. Uh, we used to joke that it was like Slack a human request. So, you know, open a, open a request for a deployment. Um, so we, we kind of started consolidating that, you know, put it all through one single ticket queue, raise the awareness that there's a ton of work, a, a, a big backlog. Um, and in the meantime, in my free time, which is to say, you know, the 50 to 60 hour time window of the week, uh, I would start writing Ansible config management for internal platforms, things which weren't production facing or customer impacting, but, you know, anything that I could, if I could upgrade the Jenkins server, the Artifactory server, and pro provide like a little bit of reliability and also like a, a feature upgrade because those systems were out of date at that point, you know, maybe that would help out, help uh, raise awareness. And the other interesting thing I did, um, interesting to me, was there was a ton of servers running in AWS. People had kind of stood them up as needed and named them whatever. We had, honestly, servers called, you know, uh, John's job runners, you know, something generic. There weren't consistent tagging and naming. So I pulled the AWS detailed billing report down, which is this enormous file of every possible event you ever get. It's like over a terabyte. Um, but it's got a ton of information. You can map it. I mapped it to product platforms and created this view month over month of platform in AWS, like the eight different product platforms. And sent that out. So I started generating that once a month manually and sending it out and I think it helped raise awareness for um, you know, where the spend was going and what was going on uh, in, in, our, in our production system. So that was the first three months or so. Fourth quarter was a lot more of the same. We borrowed someone else from elsewhere in the organization. He uh, happens to teach courses in wilderness survival which isn't germane to this conversation, but he's a cool dude. Um, I, you know, and I can give you his info if you want to learn about wilderness survival. Um, so we added, you know, borrowed someone else from elsewhere in the org, um, worked through the tickets, kind of worked really hard to just take the low hanging fruit, clear it out, try to get some of that, that backlog. We had tickets in there which were a year old, hadn't been updated in months and that sort of thing. Um, and we also, so Pinsight runs a co-location data center, a, a, a data center in a colo, right, uh, 1102 grand. And it's managed largely by a different set of teammates. And I worked on trying to bridge that and provide Ansible automation for that piece so they'd have like disk failures and the like and, uh, and you know, needed to replace them and upgrade the servers. And, Tried to help out with that. It didn't really, you know, the data center had kind of different cadence and a different set of priorities. Uh, they weren't directly the product platform. So it didn't really work out and we just redoubled on the AWS work. So that's three, six months, a lot of work, a lot of long hours, a lot of uh, manual deployments. You know, I get a text at 4 p.m. and a platform developer says, hey, I'm ready to do a deploy. And like four hours later, like, does it look good? Are we good? Um, but, but that's just the start of it, right? So going in the beginning of this year, January timeframe, uh, Scott Howell came over. He was actually doing front end development for the marketing sites and he came over willing to learn DevOps, which is awesome. Like having someone with that mindset and that approach is great to have someone that wants to learn. Um, came over, so at this point we had our wilderness survivalist guy and our front end developer and myself and, and John Ted had left at this point. Um, so three people, basically. And really, a lot of the similar stuff. We did get hit by this pretty bad um, outage. It wasn't production, but QA, we had to take down our entire QA environment and rebuild it. And luckily, I mean, the upshot is, as a result, I got to 
write some config management for, for the QA environment and uh, Wildfly Java enterprise platforms. It turned out that the production platforms were an older JBoss version, so we didn't actually deploy any of that right away. It took several more months before those playbooks got used, config management, but we got to, you know, we got to do it, get it in, in the backlog. Um, also at the time, stood up a streaming architecture in AWS, Kafka, Storm, Zookeeper, all of it, Greenfield from, so it was the first clean environment that we built while I was there and with config management. And uh, it was basically to offload compute from the data center, which was, had a lot of Hadoop storage and compute and was highly constrained, doesn't, you know, doesn't auto scale. Um, that went really well. It ran for about the next six months with really no problems until we upgraded it and expanded it, added more platforms to it. Uh, on the other hand, worked on a project, I proposed a project to leadership, got it approved to provide automation Ansible playbooks for the existing platforms, legacy platforms, and it was approved. Um, but then the release cadence didn't really allow for it. Uh, it didn't fit in with the developer's um, two-week iterations, and, and so that actually got canceled. So we tried a lot of things. Uh, some of them did pretty well. Some of them kind of, you know, raised awareness, made the developers aware that this was maybe producing less, less alerts and alarms on our platforms. Some of them didn't work at all, and they failed. Uh, projects canceled and that sort of thing. But, you know, the show or the business has to go on. Um, so we're growing at this point. The platform is growing, 500 servers at this point. A lot of, we're doing pretty substantial work in AWS. Scott was telling me actually they, they interviewed someone just the other day and he said, yeah, we're running, you know, 30 servers. And they're, uh, they have to kind of politely say like, that's great. We're running 300 or 600, um, which, I mean, numbers don't really mean much, right? They might be underutilized. It might be a, a waste of resources. But the point is, it wasn't a trivial environment. It was growing. And uh, so at this point, we had kind of an internal wiki, a documentation wiki. We started publishing standards. We part, uh, put together a diagram of all the platforms. The, we had had functional diagrams from different developer teams for one particular platform, and you know that app would write to S3, and the logs would go to S3, and that was it. That was all the developer knew. But it turned out that you know someone else on the ETL team was ingesting those logs. Um, so this is sort of hidden de dependencies, a lot of interdependencies that no one team or person was tracking. We put together this very comprehensive diagram in, in Lucid Charts, and it's you know like ANSI A4 page, huge, and you get down, it's like eight-point font, and everything's there, every single line and connection that I knew about, you know, because I'm running the security groups, I'm running the VPC, like I knew what would go into this this document, and put that together, and, and that I think also raised awareness to how complex it was and how many uh, subcomponents of each app there were, and that sort of thing. We hired someone from externally, so I had four people we actually successfully hired, and um, rather than borrow from within the company. And our director carved us off from what was previously the infrastructure team, the data center, the IT, desktop support, and that sort of thing. And uh, we were then made this new team, DevOps. And at that point, you know, we, be, we the, the, the phrase was there, the team was there, we had four people, we had a manager, and really starting to hit kind of that, you know, hockey puck of like awareness and, and success within the, within the org. Uh, so this looks like progress. This looks like good things. Um, but there's still, you know, there's still a lot, a lot of legacy stuff. Like I heard the last talk, I was behind the stage, and we had developers who had SSH access. They had pseudo rights on their platform, and uh, they would log in to Dale Logs and that sort of thing. So what do you do? Like, you can't just take it away. Like the, the previous speak, speaker mentioned, you can't take it away. You have to provide an equivalent or better alternative, like forward the logs to CloudWatch and connect CloudWatch to now actually Elasticsearch service, the managed service, or Splunk, or any of a, a ton of things. Actually, more recently, Scott showed me the, they, they have Grafana running, and, and a lot of that goes in there, and they have these Grafana dashboards so the developers don't have to worry about you know, their AWS login and that sort of thing to get access and check on this stuff. 
Um, yeah, so this, this was starting, you know, we were sort of starting to turn, turn things around a little bit, getting a little away from manual work and automation a little bit. Uh, had been asking for a while for enterprise support, and like I mentioned, I don't make the budget decisions of virtually myself. We were petitioning for this. We secured it, and you know, immediately, like, if you've not used it, if you have, when you get it, enterprise support, if you open a ticket, you have this option where they call you, and they call you immediately, they put you on hold, and then they pick, it, pick up within like five minutes. But it's, you know, it flips it around. Like, rather than you open a ticket and you hope that they get around to it in the next 12 hours, then they're calling you, and and you know our manager saw this, our our director saw this, and it got again like got noticed. We got some traction there, so uh, kept growing playbooks, automation, build automation, and internal tooling, like I mentioned earlier, Jenkins, Artifactory, and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, redeploying new platforms and and new instances of Jenkins for for other teams or whatever it might be. And again, just raising awareness, and developers were really taking notice. And we started encouraging them to use like either Vagrant or Docker uh, to do development, because in the past, they would say, well, our code's ready, it's ready to go into QA, and we're blocked on DevOps, because they need a server and they need the code deployed so that they can QA. Well, I mean, you can do a lot of that with local development, right? But if you have these interconnected platforms, you need something like Docker Compose to run them together. And uh, we kind of advised them to check it out. We like really didn't have time ourselves to, to, to write that for them or, or provide it, but they, they did. And now recently, like Scott was telling me, uh, one of our developers is using Docker Compose to, to run three of, three of the platforms, which all interconnect locally. And, and so no long, like they're no longer waiting on us. You get through an iteration and they're not spending half the iteration waiting on DevOps to turn up a server and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, platform coverage, new platforms now. We have a, uh, I didn't talk much about it, but a, a PMO org that we worked with and, and uh, PM org, which we worked with um, to uh, provide a, a gate review, architectural review for, for new product launches. And so a new product or new platform has to have functional diagrams, sequence diagrams at this like initial gate. And at the end, when it's ready to roll into production, we have launch readiness checklists, um, none of which existed before, but these are now like structural documents which, um, you know, did you load test? Did you estimate the volume of traffic that you're gonna get? At least do a calculation on that and, you know, tell us how it ought to auto scale, what the, what the dimensions for the scaling are, right? Is it, um, is it compute constrained or is it um, file descriptor constrained? That sort of thing. So this has been six months, or sorry, six quarters, uh, a year and a half, a lot of work, a lot of long hours, trying things that didn't work, things that failed. But in the end, uh, we we made a fair amount of progress. We you know now we're running. Um, Jenkins and Docker for, for builds. Um, leadership has really taken up optimization and, and cost, cost and automation uh, as, as priorities for themselves or you know, for the company. Um, and so you know, slowly, through a lot of trial and error, affected change. So it's a good thing. It's been pretty nice. The rest a tiny bit, maybe. Um, and yeah, we've gone from, you know, when I started, like, you go to copy, you deploy code, and you'd copy a server, you'd capture an AMI, <laughs> and the AWS console would say, the original AMI for this instance cannot be found, because they've been, like, ratcheted forward for three or four years, and um, uh, it was kind of just keeping things running, keeping the lights on, and now, you know, these days, we're releasing multiple times a day. Deployments, instead of taking several days of work directly with developers, instead uh, we can do multiple deploys in a week, mostly through Jenkins and Docker, like I mentioned. Um, and, uh, you know, most importantly to me, 
Like when I started, it was the infrastructure team, and it was, we're blocked on IT and that sort of thing. And now we have a team, a DevOps team, and we've brought this language into the company to say, you know, here's the terminology, right? You want to go look it up, like config management, continuous delivery. We're having discussions about how to get to CI and that sort of thing. Um, but it's, you know, it's like inception or something, right? You, you kind of whisper in the ear, the project itself fails, and then three months later, someone says, what about, um, you know, what's this thing Ansible? Like, what about config management? Um, and, it, and it's largely worked. And now, like I say, I mean, the most exciting thing for us was, you know, when the developers come to us, and they're like, hey, I got, I got this running in Vagrant, or I got it running in Docker Compose, and I just ran into this, you know, particular issue. And you go, okay, yeah, let's look at the, you know, Nginx, or the, you know, configs, or something, something of the sort. But when they come to you, and, and, and they've already, like, researched, you know, read the AWS docs, and they're like, hey, what about ALBs? Then you know that, you know, you're no longer like butting heads, you're no longer, you're the blocker and they're waiting on you and that sort of thing. And it's, you know, it's cultural, it's behavioral. So again, my name is Caleb Hyde. That's really all I have. Again, uh, Scott Howell was, uh, helped me put this together and, and was my peer at the company, but uh, he couldn't make it today. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you all so much. This is a really awesome conference.